To Kill a Mockingbird, Chapter 3, Part 2. Jim was now 12. He was becoming difficult to live with, inconsistent, and moody. His appetite was appalling, and he told me so many times to stop pestering him that I consulted Atticus. Atticus said Jim was growing. I must be patient and disturb him as little as possible. This change in Jim came about overnight, it seemed. He acquired an alien set of values and began to try to impose them on me. After one altercation, he hollered, It's time you started being a girl and acting right. I burst into tears and fled to Cal. Don't you fret too much over Mr. Jim, she began. Mr. Jim? Yeah, he's just about Mr. Jim now. He ain't that old, I said. All he needs is somebody to beat him up, and I ain't big enough. Baby, said Calpurnia, I just can't help it if Mr. Jim's growing up. He's going to want to be off to himself a lot now, doing whatever boys do. So you just come right on in the kitchen when you feel lonesome. We'll find lots of things to do in here. I felt better after that, and the beginning of the summer boded well. Jim could do as he pleased. Calpurnia would do until Dill came. She seemed glad to see me when I appeared in the kitchen, and by watching her, I began to think that there was some skill involved in being a girl. But summer came, and Dill was not there. I received a letter which said he had a new father, and he would have to stay in Meridian because they planned to build a fishing boat. He concluded by saying he would love me forever and would come and marry me as soon as he got enough money together, so please write. The fact that I had a permanent fiancé was little compensation for his absence. To me, summer was Dill. With him, life was routine. Without him, life was unbearable. I stayed miserable for two days. As if that were not enough, Atticus left us for a while because the state legislature was called into emergency session. There were sit-down strikes now in Birmingham. Bread lines in the cities grew longer. But these were events remote from the world of Jim and me. One Saturday, while Atticus was gone, Calpurnia suddenly said to me, How do you and Mr. Jim like to come to church with me tomorrow? Really? I knew Jim would be as pleased as I was. How about it? Next morning, Calpurnia had put so much starch in my dress it came up like a tent when I sat down. And she went over my patent leather shoes with a cold biscuit until she saw her face in them. She made Jim wear a tie to match his suit. Don't want anybody saying I don't look after my children, she said. First purchase, African M.E. Church, was an ancient paint-peeled frame building called First Purchase because it was paid for from the first earnings of freed slaves. Its churchyard and cemetery were of brick-hard clay. A few graves were marked with crumbling tombstones. Newer ones were outlined with brightly colored glass and broken Coca-Cola bottles. Stumps of burned-out candles stood at the heads of infant graves. A warm, bittersweet smell of Hearts of Love hairdressing mingled with asafoetida snuff, Hoyt's cologne, brown, Brown's mule, peppermint, and lilac talcum welcomed us as we joined the crowd in the churchyard. Calpurnia walked between me and Jim, responding to the greetings of her brightly clad neighbors. She introduced us to Reverend Sykes, and we entered the church. First purchase was unpainted within. Pine benches served as pews. Behind the rough oak pulpit, a faded pink silk banner proclaimed God is love. There was no sign of organ, hymn books, or programs, but at each seat was a cheap cardboard fan bearing a garish Garden of Gethsemane, courtesy of Tyndall's Hardware Co. You name it, we sell it. Calpurnia placed herself between Jim and me as Reverend Sykes stood up behind the pulpit. He was a short, stocky man in a black suit, black tie, and white shirt. He said, Brethren and sisters, we are particularly glad to have company with us this morning, Mr. and Miss Finch. You all know their father. Before I begin, there are some announcements. He read from a slip of paper. The Missionary Society meets at the home of Sister Annette Reeves next Tuesday. Bring your sewing. From another paper, he read, You all know of Brother Tom Robinson's trouble. He has been a faithful member of First Purchase since he was a boy. The collection today will go to his wife to help her out at home. He laid the papers down. Now, will the music superintendent lead us in the first hymn? Zebo, our garbage collector, and Calpurnia's son, walked down the center aisle and faced the congregation. 
He was carrying a battered hymn book. He opened it and said, we'll sing number 273. How are we going to sing without hymn books? I asked. Hush, baby, Cal whispered. You'll, you'll see. Zebo read in a voice like the rumble of distant artillery. There's a land beyond the river. Miraculously on pitch, a hundred voices sang out Zebo's words. The last syllable held to a husky hum was followed by Zebo saying that we call the sweet forever. Music again swelled around us as the congregation repeated the line, and the last note lingered, and Zebo met it with the next line, and we only reached that shore by faith's decree. At the chorus, Zebo closed the book, a signal for the congregation to proceed without his help. On the dying notes of Jubilee, Reverend Sykes stood up and called on the Lord to bless the sick and suffering, directing his attention to several specific cases. The sermon which followed was a forthright denunciation of sin. Reverend Sykes used his pulpit freely to express his views on individual lapses from grace. Jim Hardy had been absent for church for five Sundays. Constant Jackson had better stop quarreling with her neighbors. After the sermon, Reverend Sykes stood beside a table in front of the pulpit and requested the morning offering. One by one, the congregation came forward and dropped nickels and dimes into a black enameled coffee can. To Jim's and my amazement, Reverend Sykes then emptied the can onto the table and raked the coins into his hand. He straightened up and said, This is not enough. We must have ten dollars. You all know Helen can't leave those children to work while Tom's in jail. Reverend Sykes called to someone in the back, Alec, shut the doors. Nobody leaves here till we have ten dollars. He added sternly, Carlo Richard Richardson, I haven't seen you up this aisle yet. A thin man in khaki pants came up and deposited a coin. The congregation murmured approval, and Reverend Sykes said, Now I want all of you with no children to give one more dime apiece. Then we'll have it. Slowly, painfully, the ten dollars was collected. The door was opened. Zebo led us into on Jordan's stormy banks, and church was over. At the church door, while Calpurnia paused to talk with Zebo and his family, Jim and I said to Reverend Sykes, we thank you for letting us come. We were specially glad to have you all here today, he replied. This church has no better friend than your daddy. On the way home, I asked, Cal, just what did Tom Robinson do? Calpurnia sighed. Mr. Bob Ewell accused him of raping his girl and had him arrested. Mr. Ewell? My memory stirred. What? Atticus says the Ewells are absolute trash. I never heard Atticus talk about folks the way he talked about the Ewells. What's rape, Cal? It's something you'll have to ask Mr. Finch about. Are you all hungry? The Reverend took a long time unwinding this morning. He's just like our preacher, said Jim. But why do you all sing hymns that way? Lining? she asked. It's because many of our folks can't read. I'm one of them who can. Where'd you go to school, Cal? asked Jim. Nowhere. Old Miss Buford, Miss Maudie Atkinson's aunt, taught me. We were on the sidewalk by the Radley place now. Look on the porch yonder, Jim said. I looked over to the Radley place, expecting to see its phantom occupant sunning herself in the swing. The swing was empty. I mean our porch, said Jim. I looked down the street, upright, uncompromising, our Aunt Alexandra was sitting in a rocking chair, exactly as if she had sat there every day of her life. Put my bag in the front bedroom, Calpurnia, was the first thing Aunt Alexandra said. Jean Louise, stop scratching your head, was the second thing she said. Aunt Alexandra's visits from French's Landing were rare. She usually traveled in state. She owned a bright green Buick and a black chauffeur and kept in a, excuse me, both kept in an unhealthy state of tidiness. Today, they were nowhere to be seen. Have you come for a visit, Auntie? I asked. Didn't your father tell you? Jim and I shook our heads. Well, he and I decided it was time I came to stay with you for a while. For a while in Maycomb meant anything from three days to thirty years. Jim and I exchanged glances. 
Jim's growing up now, and you are too, she went on. We decided it would be best for you to have some feminine influence. What about Uncle Jimmy? Is he coming too? No, he's staying at the landing to keep the place going. I could think of nothing else to say. In fact, I could never think of anything to say to her. I once heard her tell Atticus that I was sluggish. There was a story behind her arrival, but I had no desire to extract it from her then. Today was Sunday, and Aunt Alexandra was positively irritable on the Lord's Day. I guess it was her Sunday corset. She was not fat, but solid, and she chose garments that drew up her bosom to giddy heights, pinched in her waist, and flared out her rear. From any angle, her figure was formidable. The remainder of the afternoon went by in the gentle gloom that descends when relatives appear. But the gloom was dispelled when we heard a car turn in the driveway. It was Atticus, home from Montgomery. I jumped into his arms and said, Did you bring me a book? Did you know Auntie's here? Atticus answered both questions in the affirmative. How'd you like for her to come live with us? I said I would like it very much. Lie, but one must lie under certain circumstances when one can't do anything about them. We felt it was time you children... Well, it's like this, Scout, Atticus said. Your aunt's doing me a favor. I can't stay here all day with you, and the summer's going to be a hot one. Yes, sir, I said, not understanding a word he said. Maycomb welcomed Aunt Alexandra. Miss Maudie Atkinson baked her a cake so loaded with shinny it made me tight. Miss Stephanie Crawford had long visits with her, and Miss Rachel next door had her over for coffee in the afternoons. The refreshments Auntie made for the Missionary Society added to her reputation as a hostess, and she joined and became secretary of the Maycomb Ammunesis Club. In that county, she was one of the last of her kind. She had a riverboat boarding school manners. When she had gone to school, self-doubt could not be found in any textbook, so she knew not its meaning. Given the slightest chance, she would arrange, advise, caution, and warn. She never let a chance escape her to point out the shortcomings of other tribal groups to the greater glory of our own. Let a 16-year-old girl giggle in the choir, and Auntie would say, It just goes to show you, all the Penfield women are flighty. Everybody in Maycomb, it seemed, had a streak. A drinking streak, a gambling streak, a mean streak, a funny streak. Once, when Auntie assured us that Miss Stephanie Crawford's tendency to mind other people's business was hereditary, Atticus said, Sister, when you stop to think about it, our generation's practically the first in the Finch family not to marry its cousins. Would you say the Finches have an incestuous streak? Auntie said, No, that's where we got our small hands and feet. For a while after that, we heard no more about the Finch family from Aunt Alexandra, but we heard plenty from the town. On Saturdays, armed with our nickels, squirming our way through setting si sweating sidewalk crowds, Jim and I would sometimes hear, there's his chillin', or yonder's some finches. Turning to face our accusers, we would see only a couple of farmers studying the Mako drugstore window, or two dumpy country women in straw hats sitting in a hoover cart. They can go loose and rape up the countryside for all of them who run this country care, was one observation we heard which reminded me that I had a question to ask Atticus. What's rape? I asked him that night. Atticus looked up from his paper. He sighed and said rape was carnal knowledge of a female by force and without consent. Well, if that's all it is, why did Calperny draw me up when I asked her what it was? Atticus looked pensive. What's that again? Well, I asked Calpurnia coming from church that day what it was, and she said, ask you, and now I'm asking you. His paper was now in his lap. Again, please, he said. I told him all about our trip to church with Cal, while Aunt Alexandra put down her embroidery and stared at us. You all were coming back from Calpurnia's church that Sunday? She asked. Yes, am Atticus, can I go again next Sunday? You may not said Aunt Alexandra. I wheeled around, startled. I didn't ask you. Atticus was on his feet. Apologize to your aunt, he said. I didn't ask her. I asked you. Atticus pinned me to the wall with his eye. First, apologize to your aunt. I'm sorry, auntie, I muttered. Now then, Atticus said, let's get this clear. You do as Calpurnia tells you, 
You do as I tell you, and as long as your aunt's in this house, you will do as she tells you. Understood? I understood, pondered, and concluded that the only way I could retire with a shred of dignity was to go to the bathroom. Returning, I lingered in the hall to hear a fierce discussion going on in the living room. You've got to do something about her, Auntie was saying. You've already let things go on too long. We don't need her now. Atticus's voice was even. Alexandra, Calpurnia is not leaving this house until she wants to. I couldn't have got along without her all these years. She's a faithful member of this family. I entered the living room. Atticus retreated behind his newspaper, and Aunt Alexandra began worrying her embroidery. Punk, punk, punk. Her needle broke the taut circle. She was furious. Jim got up and patted across the rug. He motioned me to follow. He led me to his room and closed the door. His face grew grave. They've been fussing, Scout. Atticus has got a lot on his mind now without us worrying him. This Tom Robinson case is worrying him to death. So you try not to antagonize Auntie, here. My feathers rose. You try to tell me what to do? Jim's maddening superiority was unbearable these days. Gee, crawling hover, Jim, I said. Who do you think you are? I mean it, Scout. You antagonize Auntie and I'll, I'll spank you. With that, I was gone. You, you, I'll kill you. He was sitting on the bed, and it was easy to grab his hair and land one on his mouth. He slapped me, and I tried another left, and he punched me. We were still struggling when Atticus separated us. That's all, he said. Both of you, go to bed right now. Jim was trying to tell me what to do. I don't have to mind him now, do I? Atticus smiled. Let's leave it at this. You and Jim mind whenever he can make you. Fair enough. Aunt Alexandra was present, but silent, and when she went down the hall with Atticus, we heard her say, just one of the things I've been telling you about. A phrase that united Jim and me again. Ours were adjoining rooms. As I shut the door between them, Jim said, Night, Scout. Night, I murmured, picking my way across the room to turn on the light. As I passed the bed, I stepped on something warm and resilient. I had the sensation that it was alive. I switched on the light and looked at the floor. Whatever I had stepped on was gone. I tapped on Jim's door. Jim, I think there's a snake under my bed. Can you come look? Jim opened the door. Hold on a minute. He went to the kitchen and fetched the broom. You better get up on the bed, he said. He made a tentative swipe under the bed. Do snakes grunt? I asked. It ain't a snake, Jim said. It's somebody. Suddenly, Dill's head shot from under the bed. Speechless, we watched him emerge by degrees. He stood up and eased his shoulders, rubbed the back of his neck. His circulation restored, he said, I'm about to perish. Got anything to eat? In a dream, I went to the kitchen. I brought him back some milk and a half pan of cornbread left from supper. Dill devoured it, and I finally found my voice. How do you get here? Refreshed by food, Dill recited this narrative. Having been bound in chains and left to die in the basement by his new father, who disliked him, and secretly kept alive on raw field peas by a passing farmer who heard his cries for help, the good man poked a bushel pod by pod through the ventilator. Dill worked himself free by pulling the chains from the wall. Still in wrist manacles, he wandered out of Meridian, where he discovered a small animal show and was immediately engaged to wash the camel. He traveled with the show all over Mississippi until he was just across the river from Maycomb. He walked the rest of the way. How'd you get here? asked Jim. He had taken $13 from his mother's purse, caught the 9 o'clock from Meridian, and got off at Maycomb Junction. He had walked the 14 miles to Maycomb. You ought to let your mother know where you are, said Jim. Dill's eyes flickered at Jim. Then Jim broke the remaining code of our childhood. He went out of the room. Atticus, his voice was distant. Can you come here a minute, sir? Beneath its sweat-streaked dirt, Dill's face went white. I felt sick. Atticus was in the doorway looking down at Dill. I found my voice. You know you ain't scared of Atticus, Dill. I'm not scared, Dill muttered. Just hungry, I'll bet. Atticus' voice had its usual pleasant dryness. Scout, we can do better than cold cornbread, can't we? 
Fill this fellow up, and when I get back, we'll see what we can see. Mr. Finch, don't tell Aunt Rachel. Don't make me go back. Please, sir, I'll run off again. Whoa, son, said Atticus. Nobody's about to make you go anywhere but to bed. I'm just going over to tell Miss Rachel you're here and ask her if you could spend the night with us. You'd like that, wouldn't you? And for goodness sake, put some of the county back where it belongs. Soil erosion's bad enough as it is. Dill stared at my father's retreating figure. He's trying to be funny, I said. He means take a bath. See there, I told you he wouldn't bother you. It's just, at home, they aren't mean. They just don't want me around, Dill said. Dill ate and ate and ate. He made his way through all the leftovers and was reaching for a can of pork and beans when he heard Miss Rachel's voice in the hall. He shivered like a rabbit, but bore with fortitude her, wait till I get you home, smiled at her, reckon you can stay one night, and returned the hug at long last bestowed upon.